Welcome to another ACM Hangout session hosted by Arts Council Malta. Today we are going to be discussing the audience research survey and the trends and patterns in audiences. Here are some more details about this session. The audience research study commissioned by Arts Council Malta examined audience attitudes, perceptions and behaviours with a focus on the changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. This study generated quite a lot of debate and questions, and an article published in the media was widely shared by practitioners, highlighting a sense of frustration and anxiety in relation to this subject. Together with our guests, we shall discuss and analyze in some more detail the audience research study in order to better understand the impact and implications of these findings in relation to the sustainability of the cultural and creative industries. Joining us for this first part of today's session are Herman Grech, Editor-in-Chief at Times of Malta and Theatre Director, and Diane Portelli, Director and Choreographer at Moveo Dance Company. Hi. Welcome to the session. Hi. So my first question, Herman, the Times has reported this study in detail and opted to go for a pretty strong title. Survey shows abysmal interest in arts and cultural events in Malta. It, it was widely shared, it was widely discussed. So why, in your opinion, um, this particular article and the study strikes a chord with the practitioners in particular? Because any survey that says 55% of people didn't send one euro on any artistic or cultural production in the previous year is abysmal. That is a reflection of the soci sorry society we live in, I would say. And um, as much as I wasn't surprised in a way, I would have thought that um, there were some improvements in, in, uh, in the last few years because there are some attempts being made to try to draw people, to put bums on seats. But um, I think some, something along the way we're just missing because when you know that so many people out there are paying um, to go to restaurants, they're paying so much money to buy their pizza and pasta every week, we invest so much money in our cars, we, we buy clothes that we will never use, and yet we remain reluctant to spend a single euro on an artistic or cultural production, that is nothing short of abysmal. So I think this is why I wanted to go for a shocking headline, mm -hmm. just to maybe jolt people into understanding that this very important sector is just being discarded, and um, this is a sorry reflection of the society that there is today. I was hoping that the figures, you know, were taking some of these statistics were taken during COVID. But they weren't. This wasn't the, you know, the 55%, I believe, correct me if I'm was, wrong, was, was taken before. before COVID started. Yes, however, this specific study did focus on the pandemic and, and kind of what w we were going through. So it is something which is expected in a way, right? It that was expected, Elaine, but we also, a lot of practitioners tried to go online to try to draw people in. Um, to actually watch um, their content or their exhibition, watch a play online, and it failed abysmally. That is something that the survey highlighted as well. I know because my, my own play um, went online as well, and while the figures from overseas, I understand, were really encouraging, a lot of people watched the play I was producing. Now, of course, it had an international mm -hmm. perspective because I was doing a play about Daphne Caruana Galizia. But from a Maltese perspective, there wasn't a uh, huge interest. And uh, so we made an effort, and yet the public did not respond. Mm -hmm. And we need and to understand why. It, it highlights other, other issues, other underlying problems, perhaps. So, Diane, what was your reaction to, to this study? <laughs> and also, I mean, coming from the dance sector, where numbers are never encouraging, yeah. also on an, a, an international level, what's, it's, what's your feedback? It's very disheartening on so many levels. I mean, Moveo is a private company, so what we are trying to do is trying to offer full-time jobs in the arts for dancers, and beyond, because we work with composers, we work with costume designers, with photographers. Mm -hmm. Unless we have an audience to support us, it doesn't give us much hope 
when it comes to producing more work and keeping more full-time jobs. I mean, it was a massive struggle keeping, it, keeping six full-time dancers during the pandemic, but we do it in the hope, you know, that when things are back on their feet, we are able to fill our theaters. Yeah. You know, what worries me even more is that when we create performances, when we go into schools, for example, we ask questions like, who has been to the Manuel Theater? And the amount of children who don't even know what the Manuel Theater is, is to me the biggest problem. Because it shows that we are not, you know, bringing up children with a knowledge of theater, of culture, which and then brings about the question, no wonder 55% don't spend the money if they don't know about it, if they are not exposed from such a young age, and then the results are going to be, you know, what they are. Exactly, and it also highlights another issue which there is, and this is kind of the sustainability of the, the sectors, of the arts in general, and also the, then the dependence on government funds because we need to keep going there um, and the implication of that. So in, in your opinion, how can this situation be addressed, perhaps on a more long-term um, level this time round? Clearly, the, the, we need to start with the education. We need to go back to basics. We need to understand that the arts, uh, you know, whatever you do, arts, music, theater, need to be compulsory at school. We cannot continue treating them like hobbies, you know. I'm from a particular generation where I had to, fo I was forced to stop my arts lessons at 12, you know. I got into theater because it kind of runs uh, in the family, you know, but, but again, I was lucky. And uh, I say this because I don't think we are understanding our education system, our educators, our politicians are not understanding that this is not about a hobby. We are talking here about the formation of society. You know, I strongly believe that without arts and, you know, if you're not imbued with, with, with culture, that reflects a very sorry society. Our education system is tailored to create a generation of people who will get jobs. Nothing wrong with us getting jobs, but are we being creative? And what are we doing? We're creating a society here which is more interested in giving people jobs and making money. And we know what happens when there's too much money around. Just look around you, just walk outside this theater. It's a bloody mess, you know? There are tasteless buildings, there are people building blocks of apartments all the same way and all that. And that's, I'm sorry, is a poor reflection of our culture, of our a society which has been fed a poor diet of greed and of education put in the wrong levels. So instead of focusing on trying to understand the beauty of art, mm -hmm. you know, the beauty of theater, dance, we are, we are just, um, our education system teaches us to pass our exams, and get a good job, become a lawyer, become a doctor, become a draftsman, no. become a journalist. And what without, about the rest? Yeah, yeah without... Uh, yes, I rest. mean, the proof is us a couple of months ago, we opened auditions for full-time contracts. So we are offering a full-time job. No, we're not looking for freelancers. We're not looking for project-based dancers, full-time dancers. Mm -hmm. We had over 200 applications. One was Maltese. <laughs> the rest were all, and we asked because of COVID and visas for third party nationals is so difficult. We had to ask for EU applications. So I'm talking about over 200 applications from the EU, but one local application. It's tragic. It's heartbreaking. And now we have a course at university, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. there's MCAST. So it's bigger than that. We are not even finding the students to apply. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell from my students as well, you know, when I tell them, you know, are you coming to watch the next performance? I can't, I have my O-levels. It's not an excuse. I did my O-levels, I did my A-levels. I never missed a performance, yes. you know. I was lucky in a way, my parents supported me. Mm -hmm. But that begs the question, are we supporting our children? Are we encouraging them, yep. you know? And the arts is education in itself, and I think that's something we are really missing. Mm -hmm. There are great initiatives now. There's the Culture Pass scheme. There are festivals like Zigozaik and this. However, 
I feel we're falling into a trap that, for example, all the performances we need to offer through the culture busking need to have a direct link to their curriculum. It needs to be okay. linked to math, to science. So the message we are given is that even within the arts, we need to link it to an academic theme. Because that is the most important exactly. thing. What happened mm -hmm. to the beauty of the arts being free, being creative, to opening their minds? Yeah. That is what's going to nurture the next generation to explore other possibilities in Malta, overseas, whatever, you know? Yeah. We need to start from a young age to yeah. free, literally, to have this freedom of expression. We can't link everything to what we think is going to get our O-levels, our A-levels, our architecture, our it goes way beyond that. It goes beyond, so, and it's made up of a number of different things and, and factors, as we mentioned. Of course. Um, in the 2016 study now, the study which was carried out um, before the, the, this one, the recent one, and also it, was, it had different parameters, but perhaps we can refer to it. There was a very interesting um, part um, where it stated that um, a, a good percentage of people interviewed wanted, actually were interested in attending and in, in watching performances, but they never did because of one reason or, or other. So what are these hurdles if there is the interest? So kind of we, we um, surpassed all the other hurdles, there is this interest, but they never actually managed to get to the theatre. So what, in your opinion, are these hurdles? It's strange, because we live on such a small island, for example. Yeah. So it's not a matter of travelling. When it comes to pricing, I've seen performances which are sold at very, very good prices. Is it a cultural ideology of... Yes, but maybe if I go have a drink, it's more of a social element, mm -hmm. you know. In London, for example, going to watch a performance at Sadler's Wells is very cool, you know. The students fight for the tickets. Why doesn't that happen here? You know, what, what's going wrong mm. in what, that But what, what are these hurdles? Perhaps like, let me dig a little bit deeper because... <laughs> I know it's a difficult question no, let me and tell it, you. it begs some thinking, but... I, in my generation, for example, we had a lot of drive. And I see it even in my own son. So many things are now taken for granted. We are exposed to so much, even online and this, mm -hmm. that there isn't that hunger. And I think we need to find that want. You know, it's not enough saying, ah, I might. No, what is going to watch a performance going to bring to the table? What's the long-term goal? I want to become a performer. I want to know more about any, anything. He mentioned the murder of, of Daphne. Why not look at it from so many different lenses, mm -hmm. you know? And that's where I feel, I keep saying, we need to approach things with an open mind. Sometimes mm -hmm. we decide, this is my point of view. I will only watch things which adhere to my point of view. You know, as an artist, I like actually watching the opposite mm -hmm. because sometimes I see things from a lens that I didn't even think of. You know, I consider myself to have quite a liberal, you know, mentality, but I want to open a conversation with everyone. And that's what I feel people don't want to do. Open up a conversation yeah. and see the other side of things. And that's what the art presents and offers. Yeah. But, but is this perhaps more the responsibility of the audience or of the practitioners? It is, it, or I, think, I think that's, she's saying we, there are too many distractions. It's about getting our priorities right. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, there is content available. There's amazing dance, there's fantastic theater in Malta. You know, and I, I, I really can't understand. It's pitiful when I go watch a play and I know everybody in the audience. It's the same people I met in the last play and the play before them, you know. So my solution is at least, at least, it's not a solution, but at least, let's start. Zigo Zyg, amazing initiative. Take it to schools, do it everywhere. Why does it need to just last for a couple of weeks, you know? So make people interested. Don't, you know, instead of schools seeing the arts and culture uh, as a distraction because it's a hobby, so it needs to come from our politicians, first and foremost, you know, because it, there is everything on the menu. We are trying as practitioners. Now, I'm not a professional, you know, but I direct the odd play. I've written a couple of plays, but I 
we make attempts to try to draw people. Just to give you an example, Lilling, when I, I had done a play called Lampedusa six years ago about mm -hmm. the migration saga, and I was told, um, why don't you also do it in Maltese? I was reluctant at first, but then I said, you know what, it's a good idea. Maybe it will draw a different kind of audience because, you know, they love labeling theater in English and Malta's elitist, this <laughs> bullshit which I can't take, you know. But then I did the same play, same actors, translated beautifully by, by Emmanuel Mifsud, and I had half the audience. Nobody showed up. And for me, that shows we have uh, such a deep problem where people are just not interested. People prefer to take care of their car and to go for their pizza rather than uh, go and spend two hours um, yeah. learning something from, from uh, theater or dance. I, I think there is a certain amount of responsibility which as artists I feel we need to take. You know? And I think it's very much about finding the fine line between artistry and accessibility. And I think as now I'm taking the burden as an artist, as an artist right? Yeah. If the more we manage to merge the two, you know, the more we might start coming up with a solution which might hopefully bring more audiences to our theatres. You know, I was mentioning to you before, we did Nutcracker mm -hmm. in Christmas. It is, you know, a very famous ballet. We gave it a contemporary touch because we are predominantly a contemporary dance company. Yes, instead of finding some very abstract, you know, title, we did the Nutcracker, you know, we presented it with a contemporary twist and we had, you know, it was sold out, you know, so people responded well. To, to so that we, Yes, so maybe if we start, you know, making more accessible performances, but at a very high quality, very high standards, starting with the younger generation, mm -hmm. maybe this way they enjoyed this show today, maybe in six months they'll be ready. But there is good quality. There is good quality. Why aren't people going? You know, I watched The Little Prince during Ziggo Zai. Yeah, that I is five-star material. That is yeah. something you stage at the it West End. Very good. I was one of maybe 10% Maltese people in the audience. 90% were foreigners. That is shameful. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't understand because it's advertised and all that. So my answer is take it to schools and make it compulsory for people to actually be watching this and encourage the school authorities to change to start diversifying. It's not all about you know, learning maths and, and geography and English. Not, not just Not that. just, not of just. course. Yeah. So one last question. Um, was the digital shift, um, in your opinion, temporary? Um, the, the study did observe that there is now reluctance, especially when compared to going back to a live performance. Um, so, so from your perspectives as practitioners and as an audience member, do you feel that this is kind of, it was a very temporary, um, quick fix solution? No. I like the idea of it, right? In the beginning when I had nothing else, the fact that I could watch Hofesh, I could watch NDT, you know, at the touch of a button was amazing. Two years in, all my meetings are online. <laughs> my son's schooling is online. Everything I have to deal with is online. Honestly, the last thing I want to do is watch what another thing online. online. <laughs> you know? And apart from that, I believe you need to create work that is not just a filmed performance, but rather a performance created for film. For, yeah. And that is very expensive and requires a lot, a lot of expertise. So I think it's a bit dangerous to just say, will film all our performances and stream them mm -hmm. because the quality is going to dip, especially when you're competing. Once you go online, you're competing against the world. Exactly. Right? And if NDT, who are one of the top dance companies in the world, are presenting an online performance, mm -hmm. they're doing it with such high, mm -hmm. you know, it's such a high caliber that it's, you're watching yeah. a movie. And also there you cannot compare the live experience with the, you, the digital experience. You know? I, they're, they're very different experiences. Yes, that's what I believe. Yeah. So I don't think one can replace the other, the, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really fighting for live theatre, to be honest. <laughs> back. It, it cannot replace it, but at the same time, if it manages to bring, you know, 
5% of the population into at least understanding what contemporary dance is and what, what, you know, watching a play online because they always come up with the excuse that it's too cold and I don't want to be in a theatre with other people and I don't want to drive because these are all excuses. But at least you can watch it from the comfort of your home. So I am in favour of that, but one does not replace the other. I agree with you. I mean, I, I would want to go watch a play in a theatre yeah. But again, you need lots of money for this. Yes, and that's... But let's face it, if it wasn't for Spazio Creative and, um, I don't know, the Arts Council, w which helped me, I w there was no way I was going to get some of my productions online. Of course. Exactly. we can't afford it. Yeah. And there, there, there's um, the need for investment yes. in, in this And sense. I think the survey shows that people are even more reluctant to spending money for online, online. performances. Exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So you need more money to create it. And people are willing to pay less. So, you know, it becomes no. a real <laughs> struggle. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Diane. Thank you, Herman, for joining us thank today you. and for sharing these thoughts with us. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. This was a study that we developed basically at the onset of the pandemic. And the reason we thought we really needed a study like this was because essentially uh, there was a gap in knowledge in terms of how audiences are actually adapting their behavior in light of the pandemic situation. So we didn't really know um, the extent to which people were interested in returning to cultural activity, the extent to which they were actually following or still engaging with cultural activity uh, throughout lockdowns, for instance, or throughout the, the, the restrictions, the various restrictions that were in place. So we, we wanted to develop a study that looked at these central questions. So the idea of the, the interest to attend physical in-person events, changes in attitudes and, and perceptions related to cultural activity, engagement in terms of online cultural activity, because that was something that we've never really looked into in any detail before, and also the, the, the extent to which people are uh, kind of interested in supporting artistic organizations and cultural organizations, either through things like donations, through uh, subscription methods, through um, pay-per-view system, for instance. So these were all new questions that had never really been studied in any detail in terms of you know, the local cultural sector. So we thought we needed a study of the sort to, uh, to really investigate these questions. Um, so we started with, with this study um, basically in October, November 2020. Uh, and we had a series of three surveys, the first one in October and then later ones in January 2021 and over the summer of 2021 as well as uh, we also had a series of focus groups with relevant stakeholders. So uh, the study was looking uh, quite specifically in terms of public cultural organizations. So many of the recommendations are quite specific to that sort of um, operation. So it it's encourages organizations to do things like get to know their audience better, keep better records of you know, their, their audiences and their interests, and also keep better data of their own operations in terms of what sort of audience engagement works and what doesn't, and, and the different contexts in which they work. Um, but on a broader level, it also encourages practitioners and organizations to kind of engage with the local community at a slightly deeper level, so to, to create a more long-lasting form of engagement, um, to, to, for example, look into cross-sector work, so to, to work with um, different sectors that maybe aren't uh, the obvious audiences for, for their sort of um, activities or their sort of work. Um, and it also uh, encourages people to think of things like co-creation, to think of um, ways in which they can pool resources and share knowledge in a more efficient manner. Um, so I think in, in terms of the recommendations, there's a lot, although it's directed towards public cultural organizations, there's a lot that potentially could be useful to, to independent practitioners, independent organizations, and even non-cultural organizations, frankly. I think um, what the study tells us about the sector as a whole is that there are quite significant challenges, and the main one being uh, engaging people. And this is something that we found, again, over several studies. The main obstacle to cultural participation is a lack of interest, generally. It's not, it's not you know, financial issues, it's not convenience, it's not time, it's a lack of interest. And that is something that in a way is much more difficult to tackle. Because if it's a logistical issue, you have quite clear solutions in terms of how to address those issues. If it's a lack of interest, a general lack of interest, it's a little more abstract. And it, it 
I think it requires a little bit more uh, soul searching, I guess, in terms of how we're actually going to address that. Nonetheless, I think the survey also shows that people really value what um, cultural organizations do. And we see that in terms of uh, their responses, in terms of um, to what extent are they willing to financially support cultural organizations, to what extent are they willing to, to donate to cultural organizations. And we saw, for example, replies like, I think around 59% are willing to give a one-off donation. Around 45% or so are willing to pay higher ticket prices following the pandemic. So I think there's also an acknowledgement that there is value in terms of what these cultural organizations are doing and the work that's being put out. Um, and I think if we're creative and clever in, in how we um, tap into those audiences, there's a, a potential for, for growth. And we are back in the studio with another guest, uh, Professor Carmel Borch, Head of Department of Art, Open Communities and Adult Education within the Faculty of Education. Welcome Hi. to this session. So, Professor, the rate of participation in the arts has always um, been quite on the low side. Um, the audience research, research study has recorded a marginally lower participation rate in 2021 when compared to 2016. So what are the factors contributing to these results, both pre-COVID and during the, the pandemic? Yeah, I would say, uh, first of all, there, is, there seems to be a dissonance between the expectations of you know, the researchers and what happens on the ground within communities now. Um, uh, First of all, in terms of the research, I'm happy with the quality, general quality of the research. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the people in general are construed within the research project as the audience. So there's this idea of, you know, uh, people not really participating actively, but, you know, coming to the event as, you know, a, the passive audience. That is, seems to be, you know, the image of the other. This is how the uh, research project construes uh, the other. That, the other as a passive, you know, audience. Now, when you have an audience and that audience is, uh, you know, uh, passive, the expectations are that the audience is coming to you on your own terms, not mm -hmm. on the audience's terms. So that is another problematic of uh, the research. So the idea of, you know, uh, passivity and the idea of uh, doing culture on my own terms, not on the people's terms. And the other issue, which obviously comes out, is this issue of behavior modification. How are we going to change audiences' behavior? And that is also another problematic because it sees the other as deficient. And we need, therefore, to fix the other in order to you know, elevate the participation, the passive participation of the audience. So what strikes me in all this project is this dissonance between the vision of cultural participation and cultural production of the researcher and what actually needs to be done in order to have a wider, you know, not passive audience, but active spect actors mm -hmm. uh, within culture. Mm -hmm. So kind of you are saying that there are two sides to the story and perhaps in this case we are focusing on what yes, we and, and, need and from this end. Not just two sides, but the two sides seems to be, uh, seem to be in dissonance Mm -hmm. you know, uh, with each other, in conflict with each other. And as a corollary of what I'm saying, I think mm -hmm. we have to uh, humbly, so to speak, uh, walk into communities and see what is being done at the popular level. Why there is such uh, a popular participation, you know, within our communities. First of all, there is the issue of space. The popular, you know, uh, whatever is happening within popular culture is happening within you know, uh, the community space. Mm -hmm. So the community is feeling home, whilst in other instances, the community has to move from one space to the other. And in many a times, the community is not feeling welcome or feeling secure within spaces like Spazio Creative, mm -hmm. Theatre, etc. So it's a question also uh, of uh, space. Now, within popular culture, because it is happening within uh, the space of the community, there is active participation. Mm -hmm. There is popular participation. So there is identification with what is happening in terms of cultural production. So mm -hmm. it's an issue of also of relevance. It's an issue of uh, identification. Mm -hmm. Because there is identification and relevance within the community, then there is ownership. Mm -hmm. So there mm -hmm. are people, you know, uh, on, sitting on committees, Talfesta, Tannar, etc. There are people who are actively involved in, uh, you know, raising funds, raising finances and doing all kinds of things within the... So there is this 
uh, in presence uh, of cultural production and there is co-production yeah. and not this issue of me coming to you on your own terms as a passive audience to whatever spectacle you have for me. So yeah. this dissonance is, comes out very clear in the expectations drawn by the researchers themselves. That's very interesting. And I, I was, in fact, going to ask what motivates audiences to participate. But I think you just answered that quite, yes. quite clearly. But now yeah. the question is, how, how do you motivate, like from, from this end and from, from the perspective of theatres, of artists, how yeah. do you motivate an audience to participate yes. and to increase those numbers that you need for your own sustainability? Yes, because this, there is this dissonance and uh, the root uh, of, these, of this dissonance is sociological in nature, it has to do with social class, it has to do with expectations tied to particular social classes. I think it's useless to do anything and remain within your comfort zone as a cultural producer. My idea of you know, um, addressing this very important issue is going to you know, uh, the community themselves. Okay. I've, I've, I've read through you know, uh, the research and I've seen, yes, people being consulted on the level of participation, but uh, I don't think that I've detected any consultation with regard uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the community's views mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on what they mean by cultural production, on what do they expect by cultural organisations? Because in Italy, Banda are you know cultural organisations as Teatro Manduel, as yes. Spazio Creativo, yes. and I did not see any consultation yes. whatsoever with these kind of organisations. Yeah. So therefore, dialogue, active dialogue, real, authentic, honest dialogue with communities is of the essence if we want to understand how communities work. Yes, perhaps in this case, the parameters of this study were a little bit different because the point of departure were, in fact, the public organizations rather than community and culture so at answer, large. It's not enough. It's um, not if we yeah, want yeah. to enhance you yes. know, uh, co production of culture. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it was um, recommended, as it was one of the Absolutely. main recommendations yes. that, that um, amongst others, you need to strengthen relations, um, yes. in fact, with local community groups, as you were saying, to increase the collective value, yes. to increase resilience, to increase social purpose. So um, why are these points so relevant and kind of how do you make them uh, help you achieve your aims as an artist? Yes, because we want to, uh, you know, change our orientation from a deficit approach mm -hmm. or rather blaming the victim for not coming to our events to an asset-based approach. From my tons of experience with communities, I see communities as an asset. They are intelligent people. They want to participate, but obviously they want to participate on their own terms, not on my own terms or on my own vision of what culture is and to add insult to injury, then blaming them for not participating on, in my cultural activities on my own uh, terms. So uh, basically, from my experience, 34 year experience with working with communities, I've always entered communities with a lot of humility. You know, and humility means opening your ears, opening your eyes to what the communities have to say, and therefore generate themes for cultural production through the community, with the community, not on behalf of the community. Mm -hmm. So that is the approach, the community-oriented or community-centered approach that we badly need in this country before we continue uh, blaming the victim for not participating. And apart from the sense of humility which you mentioned, um, when approaching communities, what are kind of the points which you really need to factor in and to be aware of? We never enter any community in a neutral way. Mm -hmm. We are not a tabula rasa. Yeah. We always enter communities with our own agenda. But humble dictates that we obviously actively listen and let, let, this is my approach always, let communities speak and then uh, generate, you know, themes which are relevant to the community, you know, immediately relevant to the community. I have full participation in cultural production because, you know, I respect the community. So all the themes are not decided by myself a priori before I enter the community, mm -hmm. but they are generated with the community. When they are generated by the community, these themes are directly relevant to the community. So there is direct ownership uh, oh. uh, by the community. And therefore, of course, you're opening the doors wide open to active participation, not passive uh, participation no. as, spec as spectators, you know, to our own spectacles. I think we haven't touched yet on uh, schools. Schools are important, you know, community uh, centers. 
and schools in general are letting us down as far as cultural you know production is concerned so our kids our youth our adults are qualifying themselves you know prima facie superficially they are educated mm -hmm. but they are trained mm -hmm. and unfortunately that kind of training that they are getting cultural production is of the lowest uh, importance so communities um, yes are more qualified but generally less prepared to consume our definition of culture and that is also related to education therefore yes, absolutely. As so i as see in my vision i haven't given up on schools but i see you know community centers like the casini and other associations as important spaces for cultural production and those are the kind of spaces that we need to uh, speak with rather than to and work with rather than work on behalf of and one last question do you think that um, the pandemic has forever changed patents because it, it also challenged yes. community communities yes. in, in in general so did it forever change trends and patents in this case forever change in the sense that you know as far as i am concerned and my colleagues are concerned uh, we're better equipped technologically so mm -hmm. we are more confident in you know uh, the use of technology so we definitely will be using you know, um, uh, technology to enhance, to widen, but uh, technology will never replace, you know, the real thing. The real thing is, needs to be, you know, experienced sensually with mm -hmm. all the senses. Yep. And I think virtually you cannot uh, reach to that level as far as sensual experience is concerned. Um, and COVID has ad added another layer of alienation. We spoke about space. This is a virtual space, which yep. is distant, you know, from the real thing. So, which explains perhaps why the level of, you know, audiences has gone down. Mm. People want the real thing. They want to touch, smell, taste, you know, the experience. Thank you very much, Professor Borch, for your insights. And we also spoke to Professor Rafael Vella precisely about the recommendations put forward by, by this study. And this is what he had to, to say about this. I uh, read... Um quite a large amount of the report, and I found it really interesting. Um, and I think that some of the recommendations uh, given in the report are really good and really important. And uh, the results themselves are an eye opener, even though I have to say that to some extent, I would also say that they weren't completely surprising either, because in a sense, this is, these are things which we already knew intuitively, but I think having concrete evidence that it's actually the case is always better. Um, some, I'd just like to make a point about the methodology that was used, um, because I think what an, an interesting part of, the, of, the, of this whole uh, study, which perhaps went unnoticed even in, you know, in the press, I'm not sure, uh, but is that it was actually directed mainly at public cultural organizations. Um, rather than at the whole cultural sector, even though then there are a number of references in the report which do refer to the cultural sector at large. And I'm saying this because I think that one needs to draw a kind of distinction between public cultural organizations on one hand and the cultural sector, which is obviously much bigger. We should not assume that culture is the pu public cultural organizations. They are part of it, but it's not the whole thing. So if uh, public cultural organizations or PCOs, as, as we call them, um, are having certain problems with reaching audiences, it does not necessarily mean that, uh, you know, the cultural sector in general is having problems. Another thing about this uh, terminology, uh, using the term, you know, public cultural organizations or PCOs, it's a term which is not very much in currency. I've, I don't normally come across it internationally. It's used quite a lot here in Malta, and I'm saying this because I know that part of the um, telephone you know, interviews which uh, were conducted, uh, I, and I think towards the end of the interview, they, uh, they try to understand whether people are aware of the work which is being done by these uh, PCOs. Um, as far as I know, the question is not included in the annex, in the report itself, the exact question, but if you were to ask most people in the street, uh, can you name any public cultural organizations, I think it's completely understandable that it's most people who say, what, what, what is this? You know, what is our PCO? Because it's a term which is used mainly locally. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that that, that is also uh, something that needs to uh, be kept in mind. However, as I said, I think there are a number of 
uh, findings and recommendations in the um, uh, in, in this report, which are really interesting. First of all, obviously the impact of, of COVID, which I think was uh, something which we all uh, knew. Um, I think something which we also need to keep in mind is the possibility that it's not necessarily the audience's fault. You know, sometimes uh, even on social media, I've seen people, you know, criticize, oh, you know, the, the Maltese public is ignorant or they don't really care about the arts and so on. Perhaps we are not doing enough to connect. Uh, ourselves, perhaps public cultural organizations are not doing enough to connect. Uh, and so, and so, you know, uh, there must be some reason why perhaps, uh, you know, the, this public, which is obviously uh, a, a very big um, general mass of people, which is, should be understood in the plural sense, rather than just the singular public, um, why this connection is not uh, taking place, or why, why it's not actually there. Um, I, I, I was a little bit, um, disappointed to some extent that perhaps because the emphasis is on PCOs in this report, then uh, we seem to be forgetting that perhaps for many people, there are other forms of entertainment, other forms of leisure, which to them are culture, but perhaps they wouldn't actually call them culture because you know we've convinced them that culture is something you find in museums. Um, so I don't know, many people might, might find their own forms of entertainment on television. Uh, I know there was another report by the Broadcasting Authority also in, in December, which said that a lot of people, especially elderly people, are, watch quite a lot of political TV, for example, which to them might be a form of leisure, might, a, a kind of cultural entertainment, if you want, or they might watch other things on TV, or they might go to religious events or to festas and so on and so forth. Does the report consider these things or is it only looking at culture from the kind of high culture perspective? So that is also something which I think one needs to uh, pay attention to. One of the, I think, good uh, things about its recommendations is the fact that it refers to cross-sectoral partnerships, really, really important. The fact that public cultural organizations need to reach out more, reach out to non-arts sectors, reach out perhaps to NGOs, which are working with different sectors in society, working with migrants, working, working in, in healthcare, uh, mental health issues, Education, of course, that is the biggest aspect which is not discussed in this report and which we know is a problem. One of the biggest challenges we have is in the educational sphere. And it feels almost like on one hand, we have one ministry which is coming up with the you know, National Cultural Policy 2021, 10 years after the National Cultural Policy 2011. Uh, we have these reports coming out. This is all really important and is co constantly telling us culture is really a part of our lives. On the other hand, we have another ministry, which is the Ministry of Education, which is basically making um, the arts obsolete, at least in the primary state sector. So there, there is a clear cross-sectoral area which needs to be studied and studied in more depth. And there needs to be some kind of discussion between the two, because if you're going to have the problems continuing in the educational sphere, it's useless to continue sort of talking about it in the culture sphere, because obviously the audiences are going to keep dropping in the future as well. Um, there was a reference as well in the recommendations to the whole idea of embracing co-curation, um, or sorry, co-creation rather, which I think is really important. And I, I have to say, I agree with this also because I, I, I happen to work in the sphere myself. Um, what I was not very keen about was the the, the way it was um, worded in the report itself. It was um, something like uh, co-creation methods may be applied in all aspects of the business. And I, that's when I started to say, okay, where are we going here? You know, um, and that I was actually quoting from the report and from the recommendations because, you know, co-creation is essentially about social justice. Uh, and the moment we start thinking of co-creation, purely or exclusively from the perspective of either artists or uh, the perspective of uh, PCOs and the, their success in terms of audience ratings, then we've completely misinterpreted or misrepresented what co-creation is all about. Because co-creation should be seen mainly from the perspective of the participants themselves. So we don't do co-creation because we want to make sure that they come back and pay us again and buy their tickets, you know, and make sure that the artist keeps making, a, 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 you know, money. And I'm not trying to suggest that, it, that there's something wrong about making money. What I'm trying, what I'm saying is, is let's not um, mix terms up in such a way that we could give the impression that it's okay to uh, create, you know, co-creative activities um, 
simply for the sake of having you know better 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 audiences because an audience and a participant are essentially two different things um essentially essentially those are my quick comments i know i don't have uh, a lot of time um but i think this was a really important exercise you know this report and uh, I'd, I'd be very interested in in seeing in the future you know whether there are more discussions about this uh, within the arts council and beyond thank you for asking me to share my views and that brings our session today to a conclusion. We thank all the participants for joining us and for sharing their ideas and their insights about the subject. We hope that you found this session interesting and engaging. Feel free to leave any comments about today's subject in the comment section below. Thank you, and we'll see you very soon for another session of the ACM Hangouts.